Hey, let's hear it again for those parents, church. Well done. Well done. Uh, let me begin with a little story today as we dig in. Uh, it was about 15 years ago. I was youth pastor here at Christ the Rock Church. And I got a little too into a video game that goes by the name of Call of Duty. Love that game. And uh, what I was doing was uh, staying online, playing these competitive matches Well past when I should have, missing time with my wife, and then I would sleep in and miss time with God, and it became clear this was disrupting my life. It was giving too much of myself to this video game, and I felt God nudging me like, Joel, you got to do something about this. My wife followed close behind saying, what are you doing, Joel? This is ridiculous. And so uh, I knew something had to change, so I confessed to my uh, mentor. I said, I've got this, I would say, idolatry addiction to this video game, and he said, Joel, you got to get it out of your life completely. And I thought the only way to do that is to remove the Xbox from my home, which, like any sensible man, would just sell the Xbox. But I thought, no, no, this is an opportunity to make a, a great teaching point to the youth group. So I wrote up a series or a little, a little talk on the dangers of idolatry and how we need to aggressively get them out of your life. And so I put this talk together, and then I was standing right here. And I put on the stage a table like this, but it was up there, and I had a cloth upon the table and a sledgehammer next to the table. And so I started to preach at the kids. I, I talked about idolatry, and I talked about, you need to get this out of your life. And then I confessed my, my addiction to this video game. And I said, I'm going to get it out of my life, and I'm going to show you today how. And so I walked up to that stage right up here, and I pulled the sledgehammer off and, and the cloth from the table. And there was my Xbox with controllers and the Call of Duty game. And I picked up the sledgehammer, and the boys are shrieking, no, Joel! But I said, I don't care. And I smashed the Xbox in front of everybody. The girls laughed. The leaders thought I was crazy. And then I walked back down to the pulpit, and I said, I am never gonna let video games rule my life again. Oh, you shouldn't clap. <laughs> not, not the point of this story. I said to the students, uh, what do you have to, what idol do you need to smash in your life? And I felt honestly like I'm turning a corner. Life is hopeful, I'm on the right track here. And that's exactly where we left the story of Nehemiah. That's the tone after Pastor Ben spoke last week. So if we're studying Nehemiah, some of you guests here. We're at the end of the series, okay? So Nehemiah was this guy who had a call on his life to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. After the exile, he went, this normal guy, they did it in 52 days. And then he brings in Ezra, who preaches, shares the law, and the people weep. They're like, wow, this is incredible. And they hear it and go, I've never heard that before. And they say, we're going to commit our lives to following the law. And they don't just make a promise. They sign an oath and say, we are going to do this. We promise. And the future looks bright. This is the first generation in the history of Israel that is going to finally follow God with all of their hearts. That's what you're left to believe. And the future looks so bright. But you know what? It's not how these stories end. Not mine, and not this one. Now, sadly, these stories reveal the hypocrisy of the human heart. Let me begin with my confession. It's four months later, and it's February. It's cold. You know what it's like. Football's over, nothing to do, and I'm like, man, I'm getting bored. I need some, something to do. And so I get on Facebook Marketplace, bloop, 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 and I find a deal on an Xbox 360. Couldn't refuse. And I, tech, I set something up, shady gas station in Green Bay, for real, it sounds like a drug deal, it's not. <laughs> and, uh, and I buy it, go right to GameStop, get another copy of Call of Duty that night, I'm playing in my basement. Couldn't hide it from my wife, she's like, what are you doing? The sheer waste of money, Joel, and, and the, what this reveals about your character, she said, what is going on? Now, epilogue, I did come to the youth group eventually and share this confession, and they were very gracious with me, but it does not hide the sheer and utter hypocrisy of my heart. Now, why do I share this with you? Because I know I'm among fellow strugglers. You struggle with hypocrisy too. You do, and I do, and today I want to talk about it. 
I want to talk about our hypocrisy, and just so you understand what I mean, that's when you say one thing and you do another. You make a promise, and then you break it off in hurting people. And so today I want to talk about how hypocrisy hurts. There are ramifications, and then I want to talk about where's the hope for hypocrites like us. And I'm going to include you in there, but I'm publicly admitting. Now, you might not be as demonstratively foolish a hypocrite as me, but I'm going to guess you struggle with those inconsistencies of character, if not flat-out hypocrisy. So let's talk about these today. So if you have your Bibles, now we come to the end of Nehemiah chapter 13, and it highlights how hypocrisy hurts. Now, here's the setup. So Nehemiah got done. The people made their promises, And you think the future's bright. He feels like my work is done. He gets called back to the citadel of Susa, a thousand miles away to King Artaxerxes, where he was serving before. And for about 10 years, he's there serving the king. And he decides now, okay, I got to go back and see my people. So he asks the king, can I go back? And the king grants him permission. And when he gets back to Jerusalem, he cannot believe what he sees. Now, rather than tell you about it myself, I've decided to bring in Nehemiah himself to tell you in his own words. Ladies and gentlemen, Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, welcome to the stage. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Pastor Joel, thank you for the invitation to come. And look at all of the people gathered in the temple. Look at all of them. Shalom, good to be with you. Welcome, grab a seat, Nehemiah. Okay, thank you, thank you. So glad you've joined us today. Uh, Church, that's Pastor Peter. I just need a little religious imagination with you today to dig in here a little. Bear with, this will be fun, okay? Thank you for joining us. Let's get right into it. So, you come back to Jerusalem, and you're just not seeing what you hope to see, are you? Not at all, Pastor Joel. The hypocrisy of the people broke my heart. It is like they forgot every promise that they made to God. That must have been so frustrating. All the time you poured into them, and this is what you get. Frustrating for me, but imagine, imagine the heart of Yahweh Mm -hmm. broken after the people made such promises. Let's talk about it. So, in chapter 10 of Nehemiah, what we read last week, they made all these promises, okay? So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna ask them about the promises they made. You talk about three specific promises in chapter 13 that the Israelites broke. Three very clear ones. And these three promises happen to be things that are important to our church. So I think there's lessons and warnings in this for us. So we're gonna go through each one, one by one. Can you share the first promise they broke? Oh, the first broken promise. Do not neglect the house of the Lord. Amen. Can, now, the specific thing from your word, I want you to listen to the specificity of this promise. Mm. Nehemiah hit it. Yes. We will not neglect the house of our God. Very clear. And we will also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. Now, let me explain why this is important. It should have been easy to do, right? Absolutely. So the house of the Lord was the temple. This is where all Jewish worship would take place. And so when festivals and celebrations would come, like thousands of people would gather there. That's where the sacrifices took place. That's where they gathered and worshiped. And the people who led that were the priests and there were a bunch of workers there. And the way that they were funded, the way that that actually ran was that the people gave something called the first fruits. That's how the thing ran. So it wouldn't be funded otherwise. And the first fruits were, they'd take up, right, back then, part of their animals, their crops, they would give that to the temple, and that would then fund it. And then we call that the tithe, which yes. is a Hebrew word for 10%, right? Correct. 10% of what they have would go to fund the work of that. And uh, so you would think, if that was happening when you came back, worship would be thriving, temples jumping. Mm. Is that what you saw? Mm. No, <laughs> not thriving. And, and, and in, in my book, I wrote... I learned that the portions assigned to the Levites, Pastor Joel, had not been given to them. And that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the services, they now had gone back to their own fields. So, I rebuked the officials and I asked them, why is the house of God neglected so? Then I called them together and I stationed them at their posts. How frustrating. Yes. Heartbreaking. In ten years. After all you did, mm. you come back, and what you're telling me you saw got so bad mm-hmm. that very little was happening at the temple, and the priests themselves had to go back to their fields. That's correct. They, no worship almost happening at all. No worship happening at all. Can I share why this is important? Please, Pastor. Okay, church, 
the, the modern day church still operates according to the temple funding idea, right? Like we're funded by you, the church. Nobody else funds the church. There's no government, there's no special interest groups, and we're never going to let them in here because it's God's people who should fund the work of the church, right? I mean, yeah, now, last week, if you were here, I gave a generally positive financial report. I am very grateful for the giving that, that this church does, but I'll be honest with you, we set our budget more according to what I know nationally the churches give and what we've historically given, and I don't, I don't believe we're living up to our full potential, what I believe we're called to do is live that 100% of people at Christ the Rock would give 10% to the church. That, that's what I think would be ideal here. And, uh, and I want that more for you than I want it for the church. So we're not money hungry here. I want you to enjoy the blessings of giving. As your pastor, I want you to enjoy the blessings of giving. I want to see us live to the full potential of our church. And I just don't think we're there yet. And here's a stat that gets me, okay? This is from uh, a nonprofit source. They collect data. Christians are given nationally at 2.5% of their income. And then during the Great Depression, we gave it 3.3. So I think in a time of relative, I mean, economic prosperity, it's, there's some hard things, but this is a decently prosperous time. We're given less than we were during the Depression. You know, we have a $3 million budget. To be honest with you, church, if we gave at our capacity, our budget should be 15 to $30 million. And I want you to imagine the kind of impact we could have with that as a church. And we're reaping, I think, as a culture, not just this church, but all churches, the fruit of that. The less and less people from younger generations are following Jesus. So it's so encouraging to see so many young families here, but less and less are following. And more churches are closing their doors than are opening their doors right now. I watched a news story this week about a church in Nina closing its doors. So they have service today, they're going to end at Christmas, and they have a for sale sign outside. Imagine the impact we could have at 10% as a church. Now God invites you to test him in the giving. There's one place he does this, Malachi 3.10. You've heard this one. Yes. Let me read this. Bring the whole tithe, that's the whole thing, into the storehouse, mm. that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing there'll be not enough room to store it. So much blessing. Okay. You want to see our country prosper? You want to really see our country reach its potential? Do not neglect the house of the Lord. Okay, we, don't, we need 100 more churches in the city if we're going to reach it. We can't see them closing their doors. Imagine what would happen if we as a church really gave it our full potential. Sometimes I challenge you, church, to just, if you're not giving something, give a little bit. Here's my challenge. Give 10%. Organize your finances in a way that does not neglect the Lord. And you want to see our country really make a difference in the world and be all that God called us to be? This is part of what it takes. So I got a little excited there. Uh, Bear with me. Yeah. I'll get passionate no about worries, this one. All right. Joe. So they broke that promise. Let's not be like them. What's the second promise they broke? Unfortunately, broken promise number two. Honor the Sabbath. Can you read exactly what they said from your word? Yes. And it was with great sincerity that the people made this promise. When the neighboring peoples brought merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath... We will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any other holy day. Uh, this must have been the easiest promise to keep, right? Who doesn't want a day off a week, right? Like one day off of work a week, you must have been like, Sh sure, I didn't even know it was in the law. Sign me up. But what happened? Why well, is this important? And let me tell you, for, for our people, it is, it's so much bigger than just a day off. The Israelites, we were enslaved by the Egyptians. Pastor Joel, as, as your people know, for 500 years, we were forced to work seven days a week, generation after generation. We were slaves to our work for our slave masters. And then God liberated us from that. And he brought us together through Moses' leadership into the desert, where then he gave us the laws uh, the Ten Commandments. And the fourth commandment is about the Sabbath. Uh, Can you read it for us? Absolutely. This is the command. Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. The day of rest. Thanks for reading that. You're yes. good at this. Well, thank you. I, I wrote see it. Why people I might like as well you be. in the follow. You're a good leader. 
So the Sabbath is a command, okay? Uh, it's God's gift to his people. It's a promise of rest. I mean, again, this is one where I sometimes go, why don't we practice this? Surely the people upheld this one. What did you see when you got back to Jerusalem? Yeah. Here's the truth. <sighs> In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in grain, loading it onto donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all of this into Jerusalem, Pastor Joel, on the Sabbath. Therefore, again, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem and on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. Oh, what a shame. I mean, how frustrating that must have seemed to you. Can you tell us how that hypocrisy hurt the community? What damage did it do? Their oath, their promise. We will honor the Sabbath, the day of rest. And now here they are, returning to the slavery of their work, returning to their heart's desire to not trust God and to need money, to, to need the activity and the, and the money that would come in. And they refuse to rest. Instead of taking the day off to delight in God and their families and to experience shalom, they just blended in with all the cultures around us which said, work and slave and give money. Can I be it honest? Was, I, I don't think we're horrible. much better. I don't think we're much better. Mm, tell me. I don't think we practice this. You know, church, the same Ten Commandments that he gave to the Israelites, he gave to us. And the fourth one is still practice the Sabbath. And yet I know very few people who actually do that. We might say we do, we, this is important. We don't practice it. And it's a shame because God gave this to us as a gift. Jesus himself said the Sabbath was made for man. Okay, and not man for the Sabbath. What he's saying is there should be one 24-hour period in a day where we rest. It's so important. The Sabbath is when we connect with each other, with family, when we reflect on our lives. It's actually meant to be a day of delight, mm -hmm. right? Where yes. we don't work. Why do we continue to work so hard? We should be practicing Sabbath church. We've preached on this, and I honestly, people were like, that's a lot of weeks on Sabbath because it's so important and yet so few people do it. Thanks for letting me challenge the church to that church. Mm. I highly encourage you, let's practice the Sabbath. But I share that because I needed to hear that as much as you did, because I'm struggling with it lately too, because it's so easy to go back into work and to break that promise. One more promise. Sadly, another broken promise. What is it? The third one, separate from foreign influences. Can you read the exact, this isn't, listen to closely what he means by this, okay? What is the exact promise they made? Yes, they made it clearly and boldly. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters to marry our sons. Okay, now let me explain this because we don't think like this in America anymore. Okay, Because the Jewish people, God said to them, for, the, for a time, marry no other race of people other than other Israelites. Again, now, that's not how we think here, but there's a, there's a good reason for this. And there's a principle that applies in the church. Can you explain a little bit about why this is so important to God? Yes, God called the Israelites to be a holy people, a holy nation who served God and who pointed other people to him. They were set apart to live this special covenant with God, Pastor Joel. And when an Israelite married a foreign person, they married into their culture with a different belief, not in Yahweh God, but in the multiplicity of gods that they worshipped. And then the children of those families would adopt those false worship of idols and other gods, and that would just be led for people to be led away, their hearts led away. So it always goes to the heart, Pastor Joel. God's heart for us. What happened when you returned? What did you see? Oh, oh. I wrote and, and I spoke to them. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Amnon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples. And they did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I'm so sorry. Mm. It's no wonder they went back to their old ways. They didn't make it one generation without breaking this promise. And as a result, their children were confused about who God was. They didn't understand their own culture. 
Now, let me explain why this matters to us Christians. There's a principle here, okay? Now, as Christians, we can marry anybody of any culture or race that we want to, say we have one rule, and that is the person that you marry must also be a follower of Jesus if you're a follower of Jesus. And now, this is, a, this is something we don't talk as clearly about, but we should. We call this yoked. The biblical idea is yoked, and this is where you would put a a piece of wood over two oxen, and they would walk together. So it's a very close partnership. This is what the Bible says about it. 2 Corinthians six fourteen says, Do not be yoked together mm-hmm. with unbelievers, for what does righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can be light have with darkness? Now, so being yoked is the most intimate kind of relationship you can have, and there's no more intimate relationship than marriage. So let me be honest. You shouldn't, as Christians, in my opinion, don't even date someone who's not a Christian. Now, I have, a, I have a, my kids go to Valley Christian, and I, I, one of the ways I serve at that school, I just volunteer, is I have a discipleship group with a bunch of young guys, a junior high school kids. And so Friday, we had the dating talk this week with these little guys, and I asked them, hey, what's the right age to, uh, to start dating? And, uh, and they all raised their hand, had a lot of, love talking about this, they were really into it. And they had some good answers, but the, uh, the answer one of them says is when you're mature enough. And I asked them, how do you know if you're mature enough? And we were able to talk about, have, we have boundaries. He said, you're mature enough to date when you have boundaries that say, I will not date someone who isn't a follower of Jesus. I will not be engaged with them sexually. I will not live with them before I'm married. That's what I told these young boys. But this is so key. And they said, well, what if you date somebody and maybe you can lead them to the Lord? I said, dating's not an evangelism strategy. Don't try it. It hasn't worked for history. That's just not the way to go about it. Find another way. We cannot be yoked with other people. And that actually, I would say, goes to business and some other partnerships. Don't be too yoked so closely with people in different partnerships. It's dangerous. The Bible's very clear about this. And yet, I feel like very few Christians pay attention to this. In fact, I feel like if you were to ask the church, should we practice Sabbath? Should we tithe? Should we be equally yoked? The church would go, yes, those are important to us. And yet, if you pulled the curtain back on the life of the church, you would see that we are not generally living according to these. We don't practice what we preach. And I'd say that, to be honest, Nehemiah, within the church... We have a lot in common with the people in your story. There's a lot of hypocrisy in our church, and it's hurting a lot of people. Nehemiah, do you have a word of wisdom for us? What should we do? Pastor Joel, I have no words of wisdom, but I do have a word of warning for my people, for your people, for for us. Our hypocrisy is hurting our witness. People see right through our empty words and when they don't match up with our actions and they see when our hearts, our hearts do not align with Yahweh God. And our children see it. Our hypocrisy is seen. May we turn our hearts to Yahweh God. I think he's right, church. And it's a hard word to hear, but I think, Nehemiah, I, th- I think you're onto something. I saw, uh, as I did my research for this message, I found this statistic. According to a Barna study, hypocrisy is the number one reason that people doubt the Christian faith. And so when asked, people say, yeah, it's a stumbling block to me. I see how you live, and I see what you say, and you don't live that way. Yeah, that makes me believe that's not really real. They say hypocrisy, the word is, the hypocrisy is actually hurting our witness. People are not coming to God, not turning to Jesus, because they, they see how we live inside of the church. And it's hard to hear. And our hypocrisy, Pastor Joel, is really only a symptom of a deeper issue. Yeah? Do you mind uh, telling us what is, what is the deeper issue? It's our hardness of heart. The problem for all of us is when we let our hearts get hard against the Lord, which in turn hardens our heart against ourselves and others. It was the same problem for my people, the Israelites. It's a sobering thing to hear, but I think he's right. It's the hardness of our hearts. We don't let God soften it. Okay, now we, 
I told them that we would talk about two things. Okay, how hypocrisy hurts. And I think we've made that clear, but what's the hope? What's the hope for hypocrites like us? What's the hope for the hardness of the human heart? Where is the hope for hypocrites like us? I'm so glad you're bringing up the hope. And after I returned to Jerusalem, God gave the prophet Ezekiel words to bring hope. Pastor Joel, could you read Ezekiel's words to people today? So we've come to the end of the book of Nehemiah. And the story ends so tragically. The hope in the story was that when we got to the end here, that this generation again was the one, the generation that finally live according to the law. And yet again, they repeat the same cycle over and over. And I don't know if you realize, but Nehemiah and his story is the end of the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament. God goes silent for 400 years and they just keep repeating this cycle over and over and over. So where is the hope Ezekiel speaks into the hope for hypocrites like us with the fifth covenantal promise from Old Testament Scripture. And we're going to study all of these in our next series. And here's what Ezekiel says. He says, in the time, in time, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove my heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is is the promise that God would eventually change our hearts. The heart of stone represents a heart unwilling, unable to follow the statutes of God. We try and we try and we try, but we cannot bring ourselves to do it. We keep going back to our other ways. It's the way we're all born. We're born with a heart of stone. The heart of flesh, though, represents a renewed and changed heart. And here's the hope. The hope is that God would actually put in us a heart that is able and longs to follow after Jesus, to follow after the commands of God. Doesn't have to try, doesn't have to go back, but actually has changed and grows more and more human with every day as we follow God. It's the promise that he gave us in this, that he would actually not count on us to do it because he knows we would fail over and over, but he would do something finally to stop this cycle and it happened 400 years after the story and we're entering into a season we're going to celebrate and anticipate the coming of his son Jesus Christ you see the only way to get the heart of flesh is to put your entire hope in in the the son of Jesus Christ, the life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ who came to earth and lived a sinless life. He did not do this thing over and over. He was not a hypocrite. He did not sin. And at the end of his life, we nailed him to a cross and his blood was spilled for the forgiveness of sin so that we can have a fresh start. And then into that fresh start comes the Holy Spirit who actually gives us the heart of flesh. And this is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, I will put in my spirit within you. And that heart changes us. That heart allows us day in and day out to grow more like Jesus. Now, we're still gonna screw up. We're still gonna reveal our hypocrisy. We may still smash an Xbox on a stage, but God will for, he can forgive these types of hypocrisy, move inside your heart, and hopefully the idea is that As you go through life, your heart becomes softer and softer until you become more like Christ and it's no burden to follow his law. And the evidence of a soft and changed heart is the willingness to name our own hypocrisy and our own sin and confess it to the Lord. So as we end today, I wanna invite you to wrestle with the question, will you name your own hypocrisy? Can you admit when you have said one thing and done another? Can you confess the promises you've made and broken and hurt other people? Can you name the inconsistencies of your life and bring them before the Lord? I want to take just a brief moment to let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and reveal where you yourself have been a hypocrite. Let's take a moment And just let the Spirit speak to our hearts today.
to end today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you to say a prayer. It's a communal prayer, much like the Israelites did in the story of Nehemiah. And we may not obey obey every one of these promises, but I think today, if you're willing and God has convicted your heart, that we can say together a prayer of confession. And I've asked Nehemiah, we're we're gonna lead this together. And then we're gonna invite you to respond. And at the end, we'll all say our final prayer together. So would you stand to your feet? And let's share this prayer of confession together And Nehemiah, will you join me as we lead this prayer? And you can see this on the screens and read along with us. O Lord, Lord, we we confess, confess, like those those in Nehemiah's time, time, we often often ignore ignore your your house and and turn turn away from your ways. Lord, Lord, forgive us for the ways we forsake your commands. We recognize the ways we allow our hearts to harden and cling to our own desires instead of seeking you. Holy Spirit, change our hearts, transform our stony hearts into hearts of flesh, tender and responsive to your Spirit. Too often we place our trust in our own ways, seeking comfort instead of living with the courage and conviction. Like the Israelites, In In Nehemiah's day, day, we turn turn aside and do what what pleases us, disregarding our promises to be faithful to your commands. Renew our hearts, O God, God, create in us a new spirit, one that longs to walk in your ways and obey your commands. We desire to be faithful, yet we fall in a world and deed. As you you promised to cleanse and restore your people, we we ask for that that cleansing cleansing today. Lord Jesus, thank you that you wash us clean so that that we may be holy as you are holy, despite our hypocrisy and selfish living. Now all of us together, fill us with with your your spirit, Lord, that we may walk in in integrity and honor you in our lives. Change us, renew us, draw us closer to your heart. Amen. Church, thank you for being a part of this series. And may you go today, not in shame of your hypocrisy, but knowing you have a Lord who forgives you and wants to change you. If you feel the need to pray or want to pray, we're always up here. Pastor Peter and I will be here along with others. If you want to get in a discipleship group, Go to the link. We want to get you in groups. That's how we grow here. If you have questions, go there as well. Otherwise, get a bowl of chili and enjoy some time together. God bless you. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.